What the hell is wrong with Bob Chipman? This is a question that a lot of people have been asking themselves recently and that I've been asking myself for a long time. While many began to notice Bob's questionable views during his involvement in Gamergate, and even more so while he was having something akin to a mental breakdown in the months leading up and following the election of Donald Trump, a breakdown that has arguably continued to this day and has only gotten worse. I have been a regular follower of Bob Chipman's work for a long while before all of this, and while I've always enjoyed his film and game criticism, I've also always been acutely aware of worrying slips of the tongue that would regularly find their way into his videos and tweets and made me wonder, what's going on in this person's head? If you don't know who Bob Chipman is, I doubt you'll be watching this video, but just in case, Chipman is an internet gaming culture and film critic who worked for Screw Attack, The Escapist, Birth Movies Death Briefly, Screw Attack Again, and now works for Geek.com, Screen Rants, as well as running his own blog and YouTube channel. Politically, he is viewed as a social justice warrior, which I personally disagree with because while he shares a lot of the movement's political views and occupies the same general sphere of the extremist left, I believe that ideologically, Bob is in a category all of his own. Which is why, in this video, I will be looking at various things he said and trying to unpack them to construct a general picture of his worldview. In the first part of this video, I'll be looking at his tweets and exploring his stance on morality, concepts of right and wrong, his feelings regarding everyone who disagrees with him, his image for a utopian world and how we can achieve this utopian world, what lengths he's willing to go to achieve it, and how he's going to solve the problem of the people who disagree with him uh, basically continuing to exist. In the second part, I'll drop all intellectual pretenses and look at other sources besides his tweets to assess his psychological and emotional state to see if there's more to his beliefs than just politics. Now, one might say that I'm in no position to judge Bob based on his online activity, considering the type of things I post and say online, and they might be right, I might be a piece of garbage, but people also say that it takes one to know one, and I definitely know one called Bob Chipman. This is where I come to the first prefix of this video and saying that this will purely focus on trying to get a peek into Movie Bob's worldview by gleaming over his tweets and several other sources, and not anything else. This video does not exist to call Bob Chipman derogatory nicknames like Movie Blob, poke fun of his diabetes, or laugh at various disturbing other things he said in the past which have gone unnoticed by most people unless they're somehow related to trying to assess his character. And while I might make a video like that at some point in the future, because I'm a giant drama whore and this all feels way too good to just pass up, none of that is relevant to this video. Furthermore, this video is not a criticism of Movie Bob's criticism of other things, because in spite of anything and everything I'm gonna say here, I still enjoy his content. And I must admit that when he's not going on insane politically driven tangents like insisting that a laughably bad movie deserves an Oscar because it has the least white people, then his videos are actually very informative. And you can't deny that Bob is very knowledgeable about film and film history. I would also like to point out that while I'm entirely aware that 140 character post-it notes dumped on the internet with no breathing room for nuance or context are not really a viable way to try and fully comprehend an individual's entire personality and worldview, I would also like to assert that I believe that in some cases this lack of ability to try and make your views more acceptable with a myriad of qualifications will drive some people to ill-advisedly express what they truly feel in a heated moment, which is how I view Bob Chipman's uh, outbursts online. Beyond that, their sheer volume and regularity are worth noting. Almost everything I'm about to show you in this video is from the last 3 or 4 years, and most of that is from the last 3 or 4 months. And this is just a sliver of a sliver of the content that could simply not fit into a single video. The second caveat I'd like to make before we start this video in earnest is to say that I fully support anyone who enjoys this video to make a copy or save a mirror for himself. This is because if it finds its way to Chipman himself, I would not be surprised if it ends up getting taken down. A similar video made by Chris Raygun was allegedly reported by Bob Chipman himself for criticizing him a few years ago, even though Bob now regularly tweets at him from behind the block. I've seen claims that this was actually not done by Bob Chipman himself, but I don't know what this is based on, and if it was done by one of his fans, functionally, it's all the same in my eyes. Furthermore, a couple of other videos like a dramatic reading of his book, a video by Lord Cat, and other videos mocking him 
are now all gone with no explanation. Hell, in one case, I even saw Bob implying he might sue a Key Farms forum member for making a video jokingly comparing him to Hitler. And least we forget, this is the man who once implicitly threatened a teenager that he will call the police on him for making fun of Kotaku's Gorilla Hernandez. Now, I'm not saying it was necessarily Bob himself who had all of these videos taken down, and this all might be a coincidence, but taking into account the frequency of this happening and Bob's overall attitude towards censorship, which is, I intend to showcase in this video, it would not be unreasonable for anyone to assume that it actually was him. And if it wasn't, and there actually is some faction of rabbit Chipman fans who report any video criticizing him, it doesn't really make a difference. In any case, since I did enjoy that Raygun video, and regret not being able to watch it again, I feel it would be a real shame if the same thing happened to my own video, which is why I fully encourage anyone who wants to, to make a copy for himself. Now with all of that out of the way, let's begin by looking at some of Bob's tweets. First let's start with a general look of what Bob believes in, in an abstract sense. Now in the past, Bob has tweeted multiple times on the subject of morality, Saying it's subjective, for example, truth is not a moral good in and of itself. And while you could judge him for the company he keeps, his statements are not necessarily morally abhorrent. What does raise a few more eyebrows is perhaps his most infamous tweet where he says, I believe that there is almost no such thing as bad tactics, only bad targets. And although this was the first time he was called out on it, it was certainly not the first time Bob has said it. Once saying in an earlier tweet, Dancing on Fred Phelps' grave does not make you as bad as him. Tactics aren't good as bad, only targets. This was also not the last time he said it because, while I did see him once accusing people of using tweets he's made in the past against him, voicing opinions he no longer believes in, presumably in reference to this exact tweet, more recently he tweeted, Remember when I said the question of targets was much more important than the question of tactics? I was right, punch a Nazi. This being in reference to the then recent assault on Richard Spencer, as well as multiple other violent assaults committed by Antifa activists. So to be clear, this is a man who believes that almost any action is permitted when directed at the right people. And I want you to remember that almost, because as much as Bob insists on highlighting it, the further I got into making this video, the more I began to believe he doesn't really mean it. So naturally this leads me to the next question of how far does almost go? The answer appears to be pretty far, as Bob explains in another infamous tweet, saying, Two fundamental questions underline 90% of my decisions. Does this get us closer to a better world? And is this morally correct in that order? Bob even demonstrates exactly what some of these acceptable tactics are, responding to the doxing of a female Gamergate supporter with, You lie with dogs, you wake up with fleas. So, to reiterate, we have a man that believes that almost any tactic even a deeply moral one is acceptable when used against some targets. Which has to have you asking who these some targets are. In the broadest terms, Bob's targets are an unholy amalgamation of nearly everyone in America. It includes conservatives, republicans, libertarians, anyone who supported Gamergate, anyone on the right of him, and seemingly even Bernie bros. But it isn't limited to political views because Bob also often admonishes anyone who is white, working class, traditionally masculine, lives in the Midwest, and, for some reason, anyone who plays first-person shooters. Which is a topic I won't be getting into here. In his mind, anyone who displays any of the traits of this patchwork caricature made out of uh, both a stereotypical 20-something LA college student and a 70-year-old toothless hillbilly must possess all the traits of both of them. And what does he think of these people? Well, aside from them being sexist, homophobic, racist clones of Hitler, which all goes without saying, in the past he's called them... Wait, I, I'm, I'm gonna need some music for this. <clears throat> Neanderthals fallen, obsolete, vestigial social cancer that must be cut out, shit-kicking terrorists and traitors akin to a number of serial killers, 
failed inferior garbage humans, a sickness that can't be cured and must be quarantined, insects deserving of a miserable childhood, human filth you should never feel bad for, remember to hate them forever because they are small-minded inferior peons, a poison that must be flushed, people who empathy is wasted on and you should feel no pity for and even joy when they lose their job or health insurance, people he enjoys watching see bad things happen to and he wants to see them made to suffer no matter by whom and for what reason because to him their suffering is porn, people who won't be punished for who they voted for but it is implied that not necessarily because they shouldn't. Worthless, worthless bastards, people who shouldn't be forgiven for their ignorance because being stupid is the same as being evil, which is why stupid people are worthless. Vestigial things that should be left behind, deserving of their own separate biological definitions so they aren't counted amongst real evolved human beings. Beneath contempt, people with quotation marks around the word people, beyond the capacity of redemption, unfit to be regarded as human, human with quotation marks around it, this time while accusing them of being hateful and breathing hate without a hint of irony, people in quotation marks again and again, ignorant simpletons, evolutionary dead ends, subhumans, a different species, people whose lives don't matter, worthless troglodytes, submentals, which is what he started calling them once he got in trouble for calling them subhumans, barely, and mind you, the barely is accentuated again, barely deserving to and he doesn't finish the sentence but he clearly means to say barely deserving to live. And the best one is where he responds to the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attack by saying that even if it was a right wing outlet, unless it was like Breitbart or Stormfront, condemning the attacks should come before anything else, implying that if it had been Breitbart that had its rightists murdered by Islamic terrorists, celebrating their murder should have come first. <sighs> The hatred is palpable, and this is merely a fraction of the endless tweets of this nature on Bob's feed. Bob's depiction of the right wing, or at least anyone he views as the right wing even if they actually aren't, is about as tasteful as a cartoon of a black person from 1940 locked away in some safe and distant somewhere. And I shudder to use this analogy, pose law and all, but Bob really does talk about these people much in the way Nazis would talk about the Jews in the 1940s including dehumanizing language, comparing them to vermin, using evolutionary terminology to mark them as inferior beings or outright segregate them from humanity, and advocated to people that, for this reason, you should not feel guilty for doing anything to them that would be immoral to do to a human being or animal. I really do hate to use this sort of analogy because I feel like I'm pandering to the lowest common denominator. And plus, Bob is not nor will he ever actually be a Nazi, he's pretty weak and powerless to do that. But the comparison continues to hold true and becomes even more troubling throughout this video, as Bob offhandedly points out that he would not automatically lock off any school of thought on more than one occasion and begins accusing his imaginary enemies of conspiring to hold back him and his fellow superior humans from their rightfully superior future as if the conservatives are an inferior race of traitors that need to be gassed. But we'll get to all of that later, for now let's get back to the point. So the next question is, what does Bob believe is the strategy for dealing with these subhumans as he calls them, besides them being made to suffer of course? Well, Bob talks about him in very combative terms. He says in this tweet that the destruction, his emphasis not mine, of the other side is more important than the purity of your own, which could be interpreted to mean you should ignore the wrongdoings of people on your own side something he both seems to practice as can be seen from previous tweets I've shown if you're at all familiar with the person he's talking to, and also something he alluded to in the past when criticizing people who applauded Wikileaks for their impartiality as they published documents that made Barack Obama look bad. Purity can also be referencing more of those immoral tactics we already talked about. Speaking of Obama, and getting back to our point, in this tweet he attacks Obama for his alleged bipartisanship followed up by praise of Hillary for his belief that if she was elected she would purge the Democratic Party of even the slightest dissent. Of Bernie he says that he's a weak candidate with no killer instinct that's unwilling to see the Republicans as his enemy, then goes on to say that they should be defeated, outmaneuvered, outvoted, boxed in and cut off. 
And these are only a few of the multiple tweets I've seen in the past few years and didn't bother to actually save, where Bob talks about his political opponents as being people that he is in a war with and them needing to be destroyed, annihilated, or eliminated. So is Bob actually advocating political violence? Well, considering the way he talks about the people he disagrees with, you'd be forgiven for simply saying yes. But since there's still some wiggle room here, let's just leave this question off for a little later. Instead, let's double back again for a moment and reiterate what we've learned. So according to Bob Chipman, anyone who disagrees with him politically is a worthless, subhuman, under-evolved, mentally deficient monster who should be treated as an enemy you should destroy by almost any immoral means necessary. So now we get to the details. How exactly do you destroy multiple demographics that may or may have not contributed to the success of a political party that you disapprove of? Well, this is where it starts to get terrifying. I've arranged the next section in what I view as an escalating scale from least to most objectionable, as we try to understand where exactly does movie Bob's political compass point. Let's start by asking ourselves how Bob feels about free speech. After all, it is the First Amendment. In the sidebar description blurb of his blog, Bob says that he is a tireless enemy of censorship, but he also says that he's an independent filmmaker, which isn't true, and that he's an annoyance to people of all political stripes, which is only true if he's talking about his personality. He also says that he's a heterosexual, which is probably <laughs> All jokes aside, in what will become a recurring theme in this video, Bob says one thing, but almost every other statement he makes on the topic seems to indicate otherwise. Like what, for example? Well, Bob thinks that freedom of speech is a battle that is devalued when the wrong people claim it. That free speech is a sacred right that we should stand up and tell certain people that they aren't allowed to taint it, seemingly by being allowed to express their opinions freely. And that too many people being allowed free speech is a quote-unquote problem if there is no one voice that can drown them all out, like a megaphone thereby allowing free speech but still stifling it by making sure people aren't actually heard. In a more practical sense, aside from everything I've mentioned at the start of the video when explaining why I'm worried it might get taken down, Bob can also be seen here tweeting at the owner of Twitter, encouraging him to ban anyone whose opinions on transgenderism and society's treatment of it recognize to any degree its negative aspects. Or, in his latest video on YouTube's age restrictions, asking them to not censor gay and pro-gay content, which I agree with, but ending the video with a plea to ban all quote-unquote Nazis, which is just a way of saying YouTubers with different viewpoints than him who are also more successful than him. Another example is here, where he leverages what little social media pool he has in an attempt to get an EA employee fired. I can't recall exactly what this was about, but it's fairly evident just from this tweet that it's something having to do with this person's political leanings. It's important to point out for the sake of fairness that Bob believes that A, the only real censorship is government censorship, and censorship by, for example, corporations or causing people to practice self-censorship with intimidation are not real censorship, and he believes that B, free speech should not be free from consequence, which are both things I completely disagree with for reasons that I won't get into in this video. But these views are still consistent with the belief that he's against censorship while acting in a way that might look to you or I as deeply censorious. This is why his views on this topic are on the list as the least objectionable thing he said and why we should really be getting on to the actually bad stuff. Moving on to a general look of his political affiliations, as for ideological stances as a whole, he says in this tweet that he believes in democracy and while I wouldn't want to contradict him, again, most of what he says on this topic makes me question if he's lying or simply doesn't understand what democracy is. In that blog description I just showed you a few minutes ago, he says he's a libertine, which is a philosophy that believes that morality is unnecessary, which explains a lot, and also he says here he's not a liberal. In another tweet, he points out he's some sort of technocrat, but considering how much of his vision for the future revolves around technology, which I'll get into later, I'm not entirely sure he doesn't think technocrats he has something to do with robots. 
In a less broad view of his beliefs, you can see here that he says he would never want to deny people the vote. He simply wishes they wouldn't vote if they're not going to take it seriously. Seriously in this case seems to mean wishes people who disagree with him wouldn't vote. Which I guess is fair because everyone wishes people whose opinions they disagree with wouldn't vote, but the way he phrases it is somewhat misleading. Next we have this tweet where he explains he's not for dictatorship, but if the ignorant are going to vote wrong, and if we look back at previous tweets we see that ignorant people by definition are people who would vote differently than him, then their votes should be overridden, which in my eyes seems like a dictatorship. So essentially, Chipman thinks that people who disagree with him should not be denied the vote, they should simply choose not to vote, and if they don't, their vote should be thrown in the trash because they shouldn't be voting anyway. Furthermore, while he said he would never want to deny people the right to vote, just as I was finishing the script, he was tweeting about how he outright wants to ban people's right to vote. When asked roughly the same question that comes to my mind when reading all of this, namely what kind of freedom is this if only people he deems fit get to enjoy it, Chippen shrugs off the rather philosophical issue of freedom itself in saying that he doesn't care for philosophy, he's more results oriented. Finally, in a series of tweets he explains he's an outright extremist and won't write off an entire tactic or school of thought if they get him closer to his goal. Like, like any school of thought, Bob? Like, like even Nazis? You know, a little almost would have actually gone a long way here. Look, look, look I even checked, it, it, it would have fit. You, you could have added an almost. Next in line we have a string of tweets where he expresses the opinion that majority rule is bad because the majority is always wrong and is on the wrong side of history. And I have to say that it's his bizarre tweets on majorities and minorities that prompted me to make this video in the first place. And I'm not the only one who noticed this because a couple of weeks ago, as of writing this, a few people looked up his tweets on words like mediocre and plurality to the same effect. Through the years I've been fascinated watching him flip-flop between saying that the right wing is an insignificant minority, quickly fading out of existence, and a misguided majority that must be overthrown. As a matter of fact, in various tweets that I'll throw up on the screen together, he said that the Republicans are a third party, too small to even be a party, that they will go away soon and that the centrists are the new right wing, and he believed up until recently that the Democrats will soon split into two parties who believe in almost exactly the same thing, which feels dangerously close to a one party system. And in some tweets that I can't be bothered to dig up again, I believe he designated Bernie Sanders as the less progressive of the two parties because he actually supports the working class, however that works. But now that Trump has been elected, his views quickly changed again from believing that the right is a feigning minority of ignorance to once again believing that they are a dangerous majority group that must be destroyed. But I digress. Here's Bob saying that 50% of the population can't be trusted to take care of themselves and that the sort of democracy he supports is a representative democracy because it allows elected officials to ignore stupid people once they're done voting for them. And this is actually as close as he comes to having a reasonable view on the topic because from here on in, well, you must force transformation to happen. Trump is your lesson about taking the sanctity of regular people's votes seriously. The intelligent members of society must have the power to overrule the ignorant and this can be done by refining democracy, which has quotation marks around it, but I actually think it needs them over here. Democrats need to find a way to win around people who don't want them in power, which sounds like a dictatorship. The fatal flaw of both the Democrats and the Republicans is the lionization of the people who aren't that right. Subverting the will of the people is good because the people are stupid. And finally, it's okay to ignore the will of the people because Hitler was elected democratically. Even, even though he wasn't. Hitler wasn't ever elected democratically. At least not by popular vote, which is the point Bob is trying to make, which means that in his own stupid analogy, his own side is the Nazis. And still, this is the comparatively tame stuff. Him tweeting things that amount to most of the people are too stupid to think for themselves and the Democratic Party should do it for them, and it's okay if the Democrats cheat their way into power and circumvent democracy itself, all the while still claiming to be pro-democracy and against dictatorship, all of this is still just the small stuff. 
My three favorite tweets of his on this topic are the next ones. The one where he says, A problem with building a political philosophy around personal responsibility is that most people don't know what's good for them. Which makes me imagine he wants the Democrats to tell us what's good for us in a sort of Orwellian Big Brother sort of way. This one where he discusses the movie Lincoln and says its message is that buying votes and perjuring yourself on the way to political power is the right thing to do. And then, just to be clear he isn't just describing the movie's moral, he continues in saying that he completely agrees with this message. Finally, this tweet where he literally says, Everyday America has begged for authoritarianism because they're weak people with weak minds. Wow. Just wow, Bob. And this is still not it. The truly terrifying stuff comes when he talks about the nuts and bolts of his brave new world, saying he's a willing pawn in the hands of globalism, that he wishes the Illuminati were real and secretly controlling the world, saying that the Brexit referendum was a mistake because it let people choose, and implying that the EU should stop the UK from seceding by force if needed, in a tweet I believe he now deleted. Here he is suggesting that local police forces should be made the arm of the DOJ, which would be literally unconstitutional, as in violating the 10th amendment of the US Constitution. And finally, lamenting that America did not devolve into a possibly violent civil war or a military regime to keep Donald Trump from taking office. But let's go back to that Department of Justice tweet for a second because there's more here. During the George Zimmerman trial, Bob mentioned them again wishing that they could somehow take over the trial and then, in his blog, seriously discussing... Well, let me, let me just read you the full text here. <clears throat> Hypothetically speaking, exactly how bad do things in Florida have to get before we declared a failed state? Because right now, I would not have one single ethical, moral, or even political issue with federal troops being deployed to occupy the damn place on the grounds that its leaders and citizenry have, by electing a government that ultimately includes this incompetent prosecution and corruption infected police department demonstrated themselves dangerously incompetent of self-government. I'm aware this is probably unconstitutional, whatever that means anymore, I just don't think it would be wrong at this point. In Texas, you're getting there too. So Bob's response to any event that vexes him is declare martial law and make the DOJ into the morality police of an Islamic state or simply into the Stasi. And one last tweet I wasn't exactly sure where I want to put, but I think would work best in this context, is the one where he says that the only solution for society is to spot people like Donald Trump and Peter Thiel and deny them success before they get it. I'm not really sure how you achieve this besides a communist dictatorship where people are denied money for thinking wrongly, but there it is. Seriously. A game multi-millionaire success story gets outed against his will and joins up with a man who had his sex tape leaked against his will, both to destroy a website that, while it has a feminist subsite, is otherwise, by any measure, and I don't say this lightly, outright misogynistic. And Bob, pro-gay Bob, pro-affirmative consent Bob, thinks that this is an unfair exploitation of the system and that Thiel should be punished by being oppressed by the state. But there is one question we left open-ended. Does Bob actually support political violence in his list of almost bad tactics? Up until maybe a week ago, I was a little iffy on giving a definitive yes or almost definitive yes on this question. Even with his tweets encouraging people to assault political dissenters, invade other nations, or prevent peaceful transfer of power through rioting, the propendence of the evidence didn't quite tip the scales towards yes until I saw a handful of tweets he made just as I was about to start recording this audio. The first one is this one, where he asks people to recognize that they are in a fight and specifically not a debate. And if you're looking for a fight that you cannot win by using words, then that leaves you with very few alternative options besides violence. Next are some real world examples of him supporting domestic terrorist hate groups by, for example, reacting to a fight between Antifa and Trump supporters at a free speech rally at UC Berkeley by claiming that Antifa were merely innocents who were unduly assaulted. Now it could be argued judging by the phrasing of this tweet that Bob was not lying, he was simply deeply ignorant to the fact that Antifa not only participated but initiated 
nearly all of the violence at that event. Given him the benefit of a doubt that he wasn't intentionally trying to obfuscate that fact, but was simply just very, very stupid. The same can be said about this tweet he made at the ACLU, condemning them for condemning Antifa for shutting down an event by attacking random civilians. Not a shadow of a doubt is left that he not only supports but also encourages this after the ACLU tweeted back at him to clarify that they oppose violence and he responded by saying that it is better to use violence than to allow Ann Coulter to speak. Finally, zooming out again from the micro to the macro, here he is saying that violence is bad only to then immediately explain that it is an acceptable way of solving problems if solving them peacefully will take longer. So does Bob Chipman support political violence like some sort of actual fascist? The answer is an almost definite yes. So now we know who Bob hates, anyone who's not progressive or from a group that progressives usually don't belong to, we know how he views them as subhuman monsters not worthy of life, we know what he wants to do with them, which is to destroy them, and we know how far he's willing to go to reach this end, as far as to support a violent revolution or even undermine democracy itself in service of his goals. The only thing we don't know is what exactly defines a subhuman beyond a slew of insults. Which leads me to our next topic, eugenics. Yes, you heard me, eugenics. While the Chipman subhuman remains ill-defined, one thing is clear about him, and that is that he is unintelligent. A connecting thread through all of Bob's tweets on the subject is him referring to those he dislikes as inferior and stupid, and himself and those he agrees with as superior and intelligent. I've seen a tweet where Bob says that when he's talking about intelligence, he doesn't mean IQ, but his lip service to this is much like his lip service to democracy, which is what I intend to demonstrate now. And as I've also shown before, but would like to sharpen this point still, Bob believes that being stupid might as well be the same as being evil, and in other tweets says that it is the same as being evil, because the two are connected. Like in this tweet, where he says that brilliant serial killers and scientists who've done bad things are outliers and are used to protect children from indoctrination about intellect and morality which are linked, which I don't know why he brings up because he doesn't think morality has any value anyway. Although, in Bob's mind, intellect simply means not being Republican and indoctrination shouldn't actually be in quotation marks because what he's describing is literally political indoctrination. Also, since no one actually says this stuff, the only way this tweet makes sense is if Bob believes that conservatives believe about themselves that they are stupid and evil. Bob's opinion of everyone he views as the right wing is in fact so low that he seems to genuinely believe that those who voted for Republicans in this election and Democrats in previous ones were Republicans and were simply so stupid that they were fooled by Obama's supposed coolness and trick by Bill Clinton's familiar Southern drawl. He goes on to say in other tweets that his fondest wish is for eugenics to not have fallen out of favor, implying that we should try and help it gain popularity again by informing people of the benefits of thinning the population, and going on to explain that too much focus on race and morality ruined the idea of giving people intelligence tests before allowing them to vote. The implication of course being that anyone who would vote differently than him would inherently fail these tests because they are genetically inferior. He also says that he believes that too much superstition revolving race is what ruined this idea, probably referring to the belief that statistically, on average, people of African descent have lower IQ levels than people of other races. Something that rings sort of false when considered that so much of Bob's own rantings on the topic focus specifically on race and place white people amidst the intellectually inferior subhumans. You can conclude as much when you take into account that in his vision for the superior world, the creation of which is virtually contingent on reducing or nearly enslaving the intellectually inferior population, he says that those he's against should be made obsolete by changing demographics, which he believes can be done if immigration, presumably from non-white countries, is increased. Then he says something that can easily be interpreted as America's population being mostly white is what's impeding its progress. So. If all of the bad people are stupid, and to weaken their voting power, you must import people from non-white countries, then it stands to reason that white people are stupid. There are other interpretations that can be made for this, but I believe I demonstrate pretty conclusively that in Bob's mind, being conservative equates to being stupid, being stupid equates to being evil, 
and that both the evil and the stupid must be subdued or eliminated in some fashion, for which eugenics would be a fitting means, the only thing that remains questionable is if he necessarily equates conservative with white, and therefore, vicariously, with intellectually inferior, therefore something that is solvable with an increase of immigration. To that end, I direct you to this tweet, where he says that the only reason the GOP exists is because white people are still allowed to vote, despite him seeing majority white states themselves as entirely useless because I guess America doesn't need factories or agriculture, only movie reviews, unless agriculture and factory work is being done by immigrants, in which case it's okay. But if you remain unconvinced that Bob's eugenics plan is not at least partially racially based, I invite you to go into the advanced Twitter search function and look up Bob Chipman's tweets including words like white, race, Caucasian, and anything else you can think of related to this topic. I'm not going to bother showing you these tweets because I, like I imagine you will be if you follow my instructions, was overwhelmed with their sheer volume. Some of them were troubling, linking white people to everything that's bad in society and that must be eradicated for the world to prosper, alongside low intelligence of course, which they clearly possess. Others were only slightly racist but viewed in the context of everything else in this video and other tweets he's made, paint a pretty clear picture of Bob's view that mentally challenged people who are holding humanity back are either mostly white or most white people are these mentally challenged people. And if there is any doubt in your mind he's really talking about people as an inferior evolutionary dead end that will and should be destroyed or will soon die out, besides the very tweets I've already shown you calling them subhuman and a different species, and those I didn't even bother showing you, where he repeatedly refers to them as exactly that, an evolutionary offshoot that will be abandoned so it can go extinct. Here are my favorite tweets on the topic where he mentions natural selection and elaborates in a later typo tweet that it will take care of these people. Now none of this is to say that he did not try to take all of this back at some point. At a later time he made the excuse that these comments regarding eugenics were merely jokes he made years ago, but this too is a bit misleading because it was actually only 3 years ago as of making that tweet and not decades as he seems to try to make people think. And the details he goes into surely don't make it look like a joke. Also, since he constantly harps on about getting rid of unintelligent people for a better world, and since intelligence is mostly genetic, I fail to see how he's planning to breed out stupid people other than checking low IQ levels as an indicator and assuming that everyone on the right wing would have them. Lastly, all of this denial runs counter to a tweet he made just one year ago where he explains that he does think eugenics is a solution to overpopulation and too many dumb people, but it's not really eugenics as long as he doesn't go into details about how he should get this done. Which as I've shown you and I'm about to continue to show you, he, he actually sort of does. So all of this leads us to a certain tangent, a tangent that will help us better frame Bob's opinions and the path to understanding his plan to arrive at a utopia, a tangent called Ayn Rand. The one thing that Bob openly shares with conservatives is a love for Ayn Rand. In his review for the film adaptation of Atlas Shrugged, he gets sidetracked and explains that he's not opposed to Ayn Rand's ideas as he understands them, bettering society by giving free reign to superior people. When discussing the game industry as an example, he points out that his hopes are that much like in Rand's book, the people he sees as worthwhile abandon it and it collapses in on itself and dies without them. And I honestly believe he has similar hopes for America in total. In another tweet I want to show you, he says that the Trump boosting quarters of America should be abandoned politically, culturally, etc. By Trump boosting quarters, I assume he means rural areas, and by etc., I assume he means financially. An assumption that is validated by his constant tweets about hoping that the working class and Midwest residents of America lose their employment. And all of this is a part of his overarching and multi layer plan to get rid of America's parts of the population that are most likely to vote for the GOP. A plan that consists of globalization bringing in migrants and helping move production overseas, and automation making manual labor obsolete. Although I do find it somewhat funny that Chipman's solution to help the underprivileged consists of importing impoverished immigrants to do menial labor for slave wages, exporting menial labor to impoverished countries where it can be done under slave conditions, 
and all of this for the purpose of hurting America's own destitute population so that they can die out or at least stop voting. The increased immigration would also serve a dual purpose, both leaving the conservative population jobless and decreasing the percentage of Caucasians in population, which I've already explained I believe Bob thinks need to be reduced. Furthermore, since minorities have been led to believe that the Republicans hate them, it's also a great way to bring in more votes. Bob says as much in the following tweet. And as for Bob himself, let me read you a segment from a blog post he made, which ironically I believe was meant as an attempt to sympathize with Trump voters. I don't generally give much thought to the supposed victims of the changes that the globalist post-nationalist economy have brought about in the world. I live on a safe blue coast as a part of a major city, so for me globalism is an almost entirely positive force. My tech entertainment adjacent job isn't going to be shipped overseas. My local infrastructure isn't crumbling because young people are fleeing to blue cities where the jobs are. It's being built up because it is a blue city. Young people are fleeing too. Immigration has never meant more competition for scarce jobs for me. I believe that this outlook is really the only proper one for a person who hopes to live happily in the 21st century. So you see, automation and globalization have no direct effect on Schiffman, so he doesn't care. However, in one of the most bizarre tweets I remember seeing him make, he claims that the working class are a minority that in the future will be replaced by an artisan class. And while I do agree that robotics will one day make us have to change the way we think about labor, what separates me and him is the absolute glee with which he talks about the possibility of the working class he so despises losing their job and ending up on welfare. Also, I fail to see how Bob believes that this will be a superior future for him when the industry is flooded with countless newly unemployed would-be artist critics, leaving no room for the industry to support yet another hack like him. In spite of this, in another exchange he again expresses he doesn't care about these people because it isn't his job that's on the line, and believes it never will be because, unlike them, he's worked hard to make himself worthwhile. Which also isn't true, as Bob himself admits in his book, describing how he worked a dead-end retail job for a decade before starting to make videos on a whim and being picked up by Screw Attack by chance. Which doesn't really sound like working on yourself. But I'm getting off point. Another objective in Bob's quest is the crusade against masculinity, which he sees as closely tied to all the things he hates. Manual labor, the political right, everything negative he associates with the political right, anti-intellectualism, and first-person shooters. As you can see here, he associates shooting sprees with masculinity and believes the solution is to do away with it entirely, which he sees as completely unnecessary. The most telling tweet is the one where he says that the best day for humanity will be when physical strength has no more value and a person's worth will be judged solely by his intellect, followed by at a later date when he says that in the future, intellectual capital will be the only capital, something that he must think he has plenty of, as I am about to show. So what place shall Bob have in this superior future, as he calls it? Pretty high, it would seem from his own opinion of himself, according to his own words, Globalism will reward and elevate him, since he is a person of intelligence and not merely a normal ordinary human being. In fact, he is smarter than most of the people in the United States and refers to himself as an American of intelligence, which I'm not even sure is grammatically correct, but you know what, I'm a foreigner. I might be wrong on this, but you know what I'm sure is not grammatically correct? It's this tweet where he says that he knows real America is too ignorant to know what good art is after being in their midst for a hour. Instead of say, an hour. An hour Bob, like a literate person. What also isn't grammatically correct is this tweet he possibly made and quickly deleted where he uses the wrong version of the word too while ironically once again talking about his own intellectual superiority. Although you know what, this one might be fake. I only saw one guy retweet it, so this might be a photoshop. You know what isn't a photoshop for example? The time where in episode 8 of the game overthinker he calls Africa Africa is a beautiful country. You know what else isn't fake? People who reviewed his book online saying it is in desperate need of a copywriter because Bob doesn't know how punctuation works. And need I remind you yet again that this is still the same person 
who thinks that Adolf Hitler was democratically elected. This, this is the intellectual Superman who will lead us all into prosperity. Okay, but enough joking around and back to the topic of manliness. Within the various tweets on the issue, mixed in is the idea that with the death of masculinity, so will the need for physical labor die out, or vice versa, when mechanics replace workers, being manly will no longer be necessary. Bob seems to think, having only worked retail jobs in his life, that manual labor requires actual physical strength. But as a person who's done his fair share of grunt work, I can tell you that even someone with an average physique, or let's be honest, in my case, less than average physique, can handle doing these sort of jobs if he's not a lazy fuck. And Bob's delusion that anyone doing these jobs is a testosterone-fueled behemoth seems almost childlike. Also, if I may speculate more than I've been already throughout this video, Bob feels to me like someone who's gotten bullied through high school, and as a defense, use the old adage that he'll grow up to be rich and successful, while the jocks that beat him up will work flipping burgers because he's smart and they're dumb. But unlike other people, he never really grew out of this immature state of mind. Even though, first of all, in his own book, he states that his grades in school were always bad, which doesn't really sit well with the idea he's hyper intelligent. Secondly, there's no reason to believe someone can be both physically fit and intelligent, no matter how much Bob would like to believe otherwise. Thirdly, they can even be both physically fit, intelligent, and a bully, which simply doesn't link up in Bob's mind because if you're a bully, then you're a conservative and therefore cannot be smart. Plus, I suspect that most of the people, or at least many of the people who bullied him in school, probably grew up to be more successful than he is. But Bob's hate of masculinity reeks even strongly of the odor of bitterness. If you remind yourself that in his book, which was written not long before he began espousing these ideas, he sort of humbly brags about working out, even though while he works out he still regularly eats hamburgers and spends his nights drinking and playing video games, and soon after he made a video urging gamers to take some pride in their appearance and maybe lose some weight. Unfortunately, not long after that, he began tweeting about body positivity, got diabetes, and ramped up his rhetorics about intellectualism being the only thing that should matter in the new world, and how all manual labor should be abolished alongside the troglodytes who choose it as their profession. So it seems like Bob just couldn't get fit, gave up, became bitter, and turned his resentment into a part of his ideology, saying that it's not that he wishes he could lose weight but is incapable due to his lack of willpower, but that physical fitness simply doesn't matter to him. I'm not going to bother adding any pictures in this part because I've obviously gone off track yet again. The point is, Robert's Randian worldview separates humanity into inferior and superior people, uber and untermenches if you will, the former of which is the category in which Bob himself resides. He knows he's intelligent because he's progressive, and he's progressive because that's the only choice for an intelligent person to make, and everyone else is just filth. He hates stupid people, republicans, people who play first person shooters, people who do manual labor, and bullies. And since all these things fit neatly into a stereotypical jock character in a TV show aimed at teenagers, it gives Bob a perfect and very simple cartoon to hate and traits to be rid of. So let's cycle back through everything we've seen so far one more time and see if we can combine all of Bob's opinions into a single world view. Bob Chimman believes that a large cross-section of the population, owing to their political views and a number of other factors, one of which being their skin color, are a subhuman, under-evolved, genetically and intellectually inferior race of creatures who technically aren't even human and whose inferior intellect makes them an evil that must be defeated and destroyed by almost any means necessary, up to and including either a violent uprising or the creation of an authoritarian dictatorship that only gives up the appearance of democracy while ignoring the votes of the subhumans as it tries to reduce their numbers with a combination of reducing their job prospects to reduce them to even more poverty, supplanting them with an important population of foreigners, and ultimately breeding out whoever remains with some sort of eugenics program. So if you're still watching this video, at this point you might be saying, so what? I've seen all of this, I've read the Bob Chipman threads, I've read all his tweets, I've seen all of this before, and I know Bob is a crazy bastard with nutty opinions. What's so important that you got to say that you had to make this entire stupid fucking video and waste your and my time? And here is where we get to part 2. Having established an overall picture of Bob's disturbing vision for the future as can be derived from his various tweets, now we have to take a moment and look at the man himself, or more precisely, his anger. As I've said at the beginning of this video, I've watched a lot of Bob's videos and couldn't help but notice his many Freudian slips. 
Amongst the various bizarre gaffes, there lies what pertains to this examination, his reaction to violence, and, more importantly, violence directed at people he dislikes. As I've demonstrated, Bob believes you should not shy away from almost anything as a means to an end, with violence specifically being named as one such means. But is this merely political and philosophical musings, or is there something else here? In his book, Bob briefly mentions that as early as middle school or high school, he was already seeing a therapist for, amongst other things, anger issues. He describes his confrontational attitudes towards the therapist, and judging from what I'm about to show you, I believe his self-awareness did not come soon enough to allow these people to reach any sort of progress to improving his mental health, as he is still overflowing with rage at those he sees as his enemies. You can gather as much from a number of reviews he's made and his response to scenes of violence in them, especially when that violence is directed at people he dislikes. For example, in his review of the movie King's Men, in a scene where Colin Firth's character slaughters a church full of stand-ins for the Westboro Baptist Church, Bob says this. In which Galahad finds himself trapped in a Westboro Baptist-style rural American hate church where Valentine is testing his brain weapon and is forced to brutally punch, kick, shoot, stab, and otherwise human chainsaw his way through about 50 racist, homophobic red state caricatures a scenario for one of the good guys to brutally murder dozens of people but not have the audience feel bad for watching and enjoying it. There is literally nothing going on beyond, hey, here's a whole mess of people the filmmakers and presumably most of their audience imagine it'd be satisfying to watch brutally beaten to death being brutally beaten to death. Please enjoy. Holy sh did I love watching it. Yeah, I happen to be more or less on the same page with the movie. It was really, really, really satisfying to watch 50 or so get their skulls caved in for about four minutes. Sorry. Then, in his review of the 2011 remake of the movie Straw Dogs, Bob first describes the villains of the movie as beer-swilling, deer-hunting, camo-wearing, church-boosting, pickup-driving, confederate flag-waving Neanderthals. And then says about the scene where the protagonist murders them, It's somewhat primitively satisfying to see the hero finally nut up and deliver a brutal improvised redneck beatdown in the third act. Lurie knows how to shoot violent action, the bad guys are all suitably wicked, particularly the great James Woods as a rampaging alcoholic football coach, and I'd be dishonest if I didn't admit that I completely get where Lurie is coming from with his nerdy movie guy making mincemeat out of redneck ex-varsity douchebags vengeance fantasy. But the most troubling of these instances is the review for Josh Trank's movie Chronicles from 2012, where Bob says, Was I still no. kinda sorta rooting for the quote-unquote villain when it came down to it? <laughs> you have to ask? Now, on the face of it, this doesn't seem so bad, but the quote-unquote villain in this movie, and this being also in quotes by me, is a bully teenager who gets telekinetic powers and goes crazy, using them to rip out a bully's teeth and go on a rampage ending in his own death. Just before he does that though, he begins talking about himself in terms of evolution and natural selection, much like Bob does. But the strangest thing here is, and bear in mind I could be completely wrong about this, I vividly remember Bob saying in this review that if he was the character or in his shoes, he would do the same. But when I went back to look for it again this week, that part of the review seems to be gone. Now, I could be wrong, and apart from a few comments on this blog that seem to support what I'm saying, I can't find any real evidence to support that the video was somehow altered. So again, this is most probably me misremembering things, but I still felt I should mention this just in case I'm not. So these are Bob's reactions to scenes where characters of conservatives, bullies, and conservative bullies are slaughtered en masse. It would be one thing if he had used these scenes as an opportunity to justify political violence, which would have been bad enough, but something that Bob could have lent at least a surface level appearance of reasonability to for anyone that doesn't dig too deeply into what he said. Something he often does when performing logical contortions to justify otherwise indefensible ideas in his reviews. If that was the case, I could then once again bring up these tweets which I've already shown you and, in this context, they would simply fall into place in the overall narrative about Bob's worldview. But listening to Bob have such a visceral response to depictions of people he regularly dehumanizes and talks about destroying being killed, well, this paints these tweets in a much more frightening light. Apart from these tweets, I remember there being at least one more instance where I remember myself being utterly creeped out by Bob's response to a violent scene, but for the life of me, I can't seem to recall what it was about. But it doesn't end here, because again, this idea of mine regarding Bob is reinforced by more tweets. 
There's of course everything I've shown you up to now, trying to prove his support of political violence as a means to an end, which could still maybe be disregarded as the result of political ideology and not homicidal rage. But there's also these. A conversation he's having with Jonathan McIntosh where he admits to fantasizing about zapping away, as in murdering, hordes of Gamergate supporters, or this next one where he says that if he had the money of Trump supporter Palmer Lucky, he would do terrible things with the word terrible being highlighted in a creepy fashion. So from the top, Bob is a man with anger issues who routinely dehumanizes a group of people, admits to enjoying watching depictions of them being killed, confesses to fantasizing about killing them, acknowledges that if he had financial or supernatural powers he would hurt them, and encourages others to assault them because they don't deserve to be treated morally. Is, is Bob even safe to be around? I'm, I'm asking that seriously. Now, at this point, this could all still be forgiven and hand waved the way as much to do about nothing by those eager to do so. And indeed, even after I finish this video, those same people remain unalarmed by everything I've shown so far. Still, in hopes of convincing at least a few last diehard converts that Bob is more than simply a pompous ass who occasionally trips over his own hubris and lands himself ass first in some questionable positions, there is one last facet of this I believe is worth exploring. If you're a regular watcher of Bob's videos, you may have noticed, as I have, how often he'll arrive at far-reaching conclusions over nearly nothing. It's no rare occasion for Bob's videos to stumble down an irrelevant road to an unrelated aside that not only has little to do with the topic at hand, but even less of a tangible connection to reality itself. Bob will often link fancy onto fancy, ascribing malicious and outright ridiculous motivations to wide swaths of the population that they do not have nor have ever actually occurred to them, ranging from imagining a nefarious cloak and dagger plot by some ill-described right-wing establishment to take over video gaming, to the most recent delusion that comes to mind where he essentially explained that the reason characters played by Leonardo DiCaprio are often seen suffering or being brutalized in his movies is that it's his way of atoning for starring in Titanic because he hates himself and feels guilty for starring in a movie that was enjoyed by women. Yeah, seriously. These statements and many more can over time begin to sound outright conspiratorial, but that's only because that's exactly what they are. In 2016, on a stream called The Bachelor Saturday Night Livestream, a special guest was featured named James Hanfield. He was featured because he claimed that he was familiar with Bob many years ago when both of them frequented a bizarre chat room for atheist extremists. From then on, what he unfolds is heroin. According to James, the chat room was called like and involves people who, due to a lack of understanding of how quantum physics works, believed that they could, using only their minds, warp reality itself. While he doesn't specify that Bob himself believed any of this or suggests that he probably didn't, he says that some of the things that were discussed on that chat room made their way into Bob's various videos as major plot points in the game Overthinker. What he does say specifically about Bob is that he would often describe bizarre dreams or perhaps even delusions about being given a magical sword by former Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata to fight an army of people who played first person shooters. These dreams later made their way into the long monologue in one of the first episodes of the game Overthinker, and hilariously, a bad fanfiction that was once featured on the now defunct awful fanfiction list on TV Tropes, which despite my damnedest efforts, I was not able to find and would give my left testicle to read. And while all of this is very interesting and Bob's crazy Nintendo obsession is worthy of its own video, the really strange part comes in the form of Bob's conspiratorial fantasies. Allegedly, according to James, Bob would often go on rants, explaining how anti-drug video games and cartoons were part of a government ploy to cause the crack epidemic in the 90s and 80s in black neighborhoods. And much in the same way, the rise of popularity of first-person shooters was only one part of a multi-tier plan by the US government which culminated in the 9-11 attacks. Seriously. While there is no proof and can never be proof of any of this being true or not because it was all in an IRC chat many many years ago, I'm inclined to believe it for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm inclined to believe it because, as I've already expressed, even some of Bob's normal theories strike me as deliriously conspiratorial. Secondly, I'm inclined to believe it because I've seen several tweets where Bob mentions games like Gears of War and 9-11 in the same breath, although I only bothered to save one. 
Thirdly, I'm inclined to believe it because these are far from the only imaginary cabals I've seen the man conjure up out of thin air. Let me direct you to some of Bob's greatest hits from inside his tinfoil case mind, such as him saying that Gamergate was a part of a right-wing conspiracy plot to invade gaming. This tweet where he says that anyone expressing concern of Hillary Clinton's statements regarding military action in Russia resulting in nuclear war is a Russian spy, the multiple times he went on about how Hillary's awful campaign is actually part of a brilliant plan to destroy the GOP forever using Trump, although this one turned out to be sort of true because some of the DNC email hacks revealed that they were trying to promote Trump as a pot piper candidate which is hilarious. Anyway, there is also this tweet where he says that Halo 4 was released on election day as an outright conspiracy, he uses that word conspiracy, to stop Obama from being elected. And finally, this Alex Jones level tweet that deserves to be read in an old prospector voice where he essentially says, They all laughed at me and said I was crazy when I said Gamergate was actually a conspiracy to stop Hillary from becoming president. Well, who's crazy now? The answer is you. It's still you, Bob. My old prospector voice isn't very good. Lastly, I believe James' story not only because it's too elaborate to simply be making up, but also because he mentions Bob was somehow traumatized by the death of his grandmother, and once when I tweeted at Bob when he was talking about her having Parkinson's disease and made an unrelated joke at his expense, he finally blocked me, even though he said in the past he doesn't block trolls and prefers to humiliate them publicly or something along those lines. And in spite of the fact, I constantly tweeted jokes at him, and he never blocked me before, so I guess this is actually a really touchy subject. Which would of course fall in line with the story this person is telling. But this, like everything else here, is just a lot of guesswork. When confronted with this, Chimpin tried to deny and discredit the allegations by pointing out that James was wrong and his father was not dead. Although James didn't actually say he was dead, he said he was either dead or not in the picture, which I actually believe is also not correct. In any case, when James was shown Bob's tweet and repeated his claims, and when Bob was shown James's tweet insisting it was true, he revised his statement to... And you haven't attended college since 2005 as I understand it? Correct. When in 2005? Don't recall. Did you go to the spring semester? I don't recall. Don't recall whether you went to the fall semester? Don't recall. When did you produce your last movie? I don't recall. Produced a movie in 2005? I don't recall. Did you produce a movie in 2004? I don't recall. No idea? No. What movies have you produced in the last three years? I don't recall. Have you produced one movie in the last three years? I don't remember. You don't remember whether that's you what produced I, a movie in the last three years? That's what I told you a couple seconds ago when you asked me. Yeah. I said I don't remember. You don't remember? No, the busy days, long hours. Uh -huh. It affects remembering everything. Which is usually something people say when they know something is true but don't want to admit it, but also don't want to outright lie. Oh, and the reason James had to be shown this tweet rather than respond to it directly is because, according to him, Bob had already blocked him from being black and voting for Trump. Is is this where I play the Larry David music? Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. <laughs> No, no, wait, let me, let me add some fart noise to make it original. So, assuming I've convinced you that Bob Chipman's belief in conspiracy theories is real, and assuming I've convinced you that his anger is constantly on the verge of boiling over into violence, and assuming I've convinced you of everything thus far, let us, for the final time, cycle over everything we know or believe we know about Bob Chipman, his political philosophy, his views, his emotional and mental state, his vision for a utopian world, his path of achieving it, and try to build a single description of the man containing all of the above. Bob Movie Bob Chipman is an angry, bordering on violent conspiracy nut who believes that a wide section of the population that includes in its main characteristics all Republicans, conservatives, centrists and non-progressives, and in its secondary characteristics the entire American Midwest, working class, all rural and southern parts of the United States, as well as the majority of men, Caucasians, and non-minorities, are all a subhuman, intellectually inferior breed of detestable vermins, who you shouldn't think of as human beings, 
and whose genetically inferior minds are keeping the superior race or group or section of people from their superior future. This superior group is comprised of Americans of intelligence that include himself, him being one of the smartest people in the United States and are being denied their rightly deserved superior future by these subhumans. The solution to this problem, according to Bob, is made up of multiple steps, beginning with globalization robbing the subhumans of their jobs in multiple ways, as well as supplanting the local population with immigrants to perhaps reduce the white or unintelligent population or at least bring in democratic voters. The next step is automation of labor to further impoverish them and finally, either intellect-based voting permission tests that he believes conservatives will inherently fail or a eugenics plan to breed them out of existence. If the solution is too time-consuming, the next alternative is an outright subversion of democracy where the government simply ignores the vote of the filthy peasant class and does whatever it sees fit, while electing a liberal president every single time regardless of votes, while they wait for the undesirables to slowly die out as a result of all the other factors I've mentioned before. If this does not work, Bob remains open to any method or any political ideology using almost any means to get rid of the unwanted population no matter how immoral, and does not shy away from the idea of violence if necessary, and while he never outright says we should kill the subhumans, this man, whose anger issues have landed him in therapy from a young age, openly admits that he gleefully watches depictions of these people being murdered, knows that if he had power he would surely hurt them, and on at least one occasion admitted to fantasizing about killing them. Well, if he had any actual power in the world, I think I would be lined up against the wall waiting to be shot. And that's basically it, the end of the video, but not really, because I want you to understand this. This video is not the result of deep digging. This video is not the result of extensive research. Sure, when I started it, I was planning to look much deeper than I actually did, armed with only a few tweets, some sound bites I remembered, and a vague idea of what I wanted to say with only a few pieces of the puzzle missing to fully complete the picture. What I ended up finding was so much more. A mere cursory glance at some of the links produced all you see before you and led me down a path I didn't expect to go on. From the first moment I began looking into this, I was inundated with so much content I knew that if I tried to dig any deeper, I would be reading boring internet blogs for months and creating a video that lasts several hours. In the end, I had to force myself to stop looking, because every time I'd go back I'd find additional instances of Bob sinking to new lows. Even now, as I was fact-checking a few last things, a peek at Bob's timeline revealed him over the last day and a half finding new dehumanizing ways to describe conservatives, laughing at people losing their health benefits, celebrating ukulele removing John Tron's cameo from their game over political disagreements, which he still doesn't see as censorship, and questioning the necessity of allowing certain people to vote for the millionth time. None of which I bothered to screen cap, because I have no doubt in my mind that if you go to his account right now, you will undoubtedly find much more of the same example. Hell, in this month alone he managed to plumb new depths which I didn't believe he would stoop to, first by blaming Chechnya putting gay people in death camps on Christianity, then following that up by showing more ignorance in geopolitics by doubling down and blaming Russia after it was pointed out to him that the country is 96% Muslim, then continuing to take all the things I spent the entire video trying to prove and outright stating them. Going so far as to say he doesn't see people who disagree with him as human, that if it weren't for them being white we wouldn't allow mediocre people to continue to exist, that there is nothing wrong with being average and that average people have the right to live, as if anyone else besides Bob needs that spelled out for them, only for them to him immediately follow this up with the words, but if averageness tries to hold us back, sympathy should go out the window, seemingly cancelling out his previous statement that these people deserve to live. Jesus. So, in the end, I didn't read Bob's blog besides a few posts I was directed towards. I didn't watch any of his videos that I haven't watched before besides one I was pointed to. Despite the fact that what I saw was so hilarious, it could easily make content for one of my regular videos. I didn't even rewatch all the videos that I've already seen. I didn't even dive deeply into his Twitter to look up some tweets I remember him making long ago that no one made much fuss about but made me think of making this video in the first place. I even left out all the funny stuff I was going to talk about before I realized what the scope of this video would be and decided to focus only on the political stuff, even though there was enough there to make a video all of its own. The only thing I did do was read his book, which I was intending to read for a long time now out of pure morbid curiosity, and even then I couldn't stomach it past the autobiographical part. I didn't do any of these things because there was no need nor even the possibility to keep going, because what I had already found was way, way more than enough. 
and all of that was only scratching the surface of the tip of the iceberg that is too big to be melted with the power of a thousand burning suns. And you want to see something really scary? Think back on Bob's grammatical errors. Think back of all of his basic mistakes. Think back of everything I've shown you so far. And then, once you have that firmly in mind, read this tweet for yourself. Scary, right? Imagine this guy shaping young minds. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you losers would excuse me, I just received a lovely email from a man named Cha Bipman inviting me to a free ride on his helicopter. See ya!